everybody, and welcome to the GOG live stream for Wednesday, March 15th, 2015. I'm Mega Pie Man PhD, and today I have with me Louis Olivan from Fixurama Studios, and we're going to be talking about their game, Dead Synchrosity, Tomorrow Comes Today. I'm pretty sure I said that wrong again. I don't know why, but I. Synchro, Synchro City. Synchrosity. It's like that. Anyway. How are you doing today, Lewis? Hi, hi, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, we know it's a very complicated title, you know, it's the first puzzle of the game to say the title right, yeah. <laughs> I like it, I like it. All right, so during this interview or stream, it's going, to, it's going to be kind of an interview thing. I am opening up questions to the chat, so if anybody in chat has any questions for Lewis about the game, feel free to post those in chat, and either he or I uh, will be able to get to them. If I see them, then I'll move on to him if he says them. Feel free to answer them whenever you see a question that you specifically want to answer there in chat. So if anybody wants to know anything about the game, go ahead and ask it, and we'll try to make sure to cover as many people as possible. But I guess the first question to actually ask ask is who are you and what is it that you do well i'm i'm luis olivan and i'm the producer and pr manager at a tiny indie studio like you said called fixture studios we're located in madrid spain and uh, well that synchronicity tomorrow comes today is our first project um we're a company made by three brothers and uh, we're four people, in fact, so we're a really tiny, tiny company. I did notice that in the game's opening credits that it had a bunch of people with Olive and last name in the game. And that's pretty cool to see that you're kind of a family company. Yes, uh, the truth is that we started with our project. We, we settled Fixurama and we started to work on this game because uh, we love uh, adventure games. Uh, I, as the three brothers grew up playing adventure games together, you know, the classic games by LucasArts or Sierra Online. And uh, we've been thinking about making our own um, story-driven games since then. And, uh, well, we decided to, to go ahead and do it. So that is definitely what this game is. It is a point-and-click adventure game, very much in the style of the classic point-and-click adventure games. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the game in general? Yeah, uh, that synchronicity tomorrow comes today is the is the first installment of a two part story called Dead Synchronicity, and yes, as, as you said, it's a point and click adventure game uh, featuring uh, old school mechanics, you know, like in the classic so uh, point and click interface and inventory and uh, conversation trees and items you have to use with another items or characters. So uh, we wanted to feature a very uh, uh, comfortable, intuitive, intuitive uh, uh, way of, of playing the game, uh, but we wanted to make a darker game than is usual in point-and-click games, in, in adventure games, because usually uh, point-and-click games are, you know, like comic games or based on humor and th uh, things like that, you know, even light thrillers or whatever, mm -hmm. but we wanted to tell a very dark story. We wanted to move the players in a very dark way, so we want to make the players have a, go a good time, even having a bad time, you know, it's a very uh, uh, specific thing. That was definitely something with the LucasArts titles and the Sierra titles, a lot of them were focused around comedy more than anything yeah. really all that serious. Yes, yes, and we really have had a good time then playing those kind of games. But now that we were, you know, like uh, wanting to make our own game, uh, Alberto, who is one of my brothers, the writer, came to to Mario and me with this uh, dark, mature story of that synchronicity, and we wanted to, you know, make a game to tell that story. The important thing was to tell the story, and we saw that uh, it could be a point and click game, so we thought it was a fantastic choice. This game definitely does have a lot of story in it. I played it a little bit earlier today, and I didn't get very far in it because there is actually there's a lot of people to talk to, and there's a lot of world building and stuff going on with lore and that kind of things. So that's actually really cool to see that the game is you you really built up this whole world around the game. Yes, uh, we wanted to if we wanted to make a game which was. Uh, with, with a quite more open approach than than usual point and click games, especially nowadays. So we wanted to make a game in which the player could uh, know more and more characters progressively, face different puzzles, uh, visit 
plenty of locations because we thought it was a way to involve the player in in the game in a more effective way you know because nowadays there are a lot of adventures that are based on okay you're in a location there are a couple of puzzles then you solve them and then you move to the next location and you can't go back and you solve the puzzles and then you move on but we wanted to offer to 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 um, feature a more like free roaming experience so that after, uh, I don't know, two or three hours playing the game, there is a lot of locations in front of you that you can visit. And the, the, the most interesting thing is that they change over time. You know, uh, as, as long as you meet characters and you talk to them and you perform specific, specific actions, the descriptions of the things change, the locations uh, themselves change, because, you know, things have happened. So we wanted to offer a world that felt alive. And it definitely does. It definitely does feel alive. There was somebody talking a little bit about the volumes in chat. Um, I'm doing what I can to try to even the volumes out. The game does have some pretty good voice acting in it, so I want you guys to be able to hear that, but there is a lot of it. So I don't want it to be too loud so that you can hear both me and the developer over it. So if anybody has any issues when it comes to volumes, feel free to put that in chat and I'll do the best that I can to try to even that out and appease as many people as possible. But uh, on that, I think we'll actually get into starting the game here. Now, I did say that I did start the game a little bit earlier today and we've got about two hours in the interview um, for us to get going in the game. I would like to ask you, Lewis, what you think the better option would be. Should I continue where I left off since I'm still at the beginning area? Um, I really didn't get that far. Should I continue where I left off so we'll be able to get a little bit farther in the game and show off more of those areas, or do you think we should start at the beginning? Well, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe continue would be a good option so that you, you, uh, you can visit more locations. Uh, it's true that it, we, we like the intro of the game because it tells things about the story, but since it lasts about one minute and a half and there you made some characters, maybe it would be a good idea to continue. So let the players discover themselves the intro when they play it. All right, that seems good to me. So we will continue right where I left off, which was right here at the gate to this sort of uh, refugee slash prison camp area. So, what are a lot of the inspirations behind this game? Yes, we, as, as I said uh, before, um, we are three brothers. We played lots and lots of adventure games when we were uh, teenagers. In fact, uh, we usually played adventure texts before playing uh, adventure games. Um, text adventures, I, I'm sorry, and uh, we loved uh, LucasArts games. In fact, we're more, more keen on LucasArts than Sierra because, uh, you know, especially when LucasArts decided that you could not die in your games. It was, you know, it was awesome for us. You, you were not forced to save and save all the time so to avoid mistakes. And uh, we loved, of course, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and um, Green Fandango and, of course, Monkey Island and Sam and Max. The, maybe the, they are our favorites. But we loved games, darker games, you know, like I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream or Sanitarium that dared to treat like more mature subjects, darker subjects, you know, uh, uh, characters with... Uh, mental problems or serious problems, you know. And, uh, of course, it was some, some change upon the, the usual approach of, of adventure games. But we feel like now that the video games industry is, has, like, uh, has uh, developed a lot of subjects. Now you can make a game about whatever you feel like. So, I mean, uh, you, I think that the developers might feel free to treat every subject they feel like, you know, and now we're lucky to have games that are, uh, tell about, I don't know, suicide or serious illness or whatever, you know, and, and it's great. So we decided to go with a um, more mature subject, you know, and in our games, uh, really horrible things happen, to be, to be honest. Yeah, there's, there's definitely been a lot of bad stuff happening so far. The world that this game is set in is not a happy place. It's definitely a post-apocalyptic, some version of that with 
They think about the great wave going on that caused basically all electricity and the breakdown of society and people just trying to survive in that kind of an area. So it is definitely a more mature game that goes into a lot of areas that a lot of games don't really go. So that's that's really cool to see. Um, something that I do want to ask you is there's there's kind of been a bit of a resurgence of point-and-click adventure games. There was a while where point-and-click adventure games, they weren't totally dead, but they weren't out there in the open like they are working their way back to with things like with Telltale projects working their way to getting point-and-click adventure games back out there into the open, and things with the Book of Unwritten Tales getting back out there, and a lot of more indie devs are working on it as well. What was it that made you want to make a point-and-click adventure game now? Did you feel like this was really the best time to try to make a game in this style, to try to get uh, out there and get gather people's interest, since there seems to be more interest in this genre? Yes, well, um, we think it's uh, it's been a series of, of different factors. Uh, first, like you said, uh, there's always been adventure games. You know, the thing is that uh, they were very, very popular during during the early '90s, during the LucasArts and Sierra Online golden days. But uh, according to the numbers, there's been always point and click adventure games. The thing is that you know when uh, first person shooters come and strategy games and this kind of games appears and and consoles, well, point and click adventure games are usually not the best genre for consoles, for instance, you know, because of the interface. So uh, they lose uh, popularity. But nowadays, uh, when uh, digital distribution is is uh, uh, easy to reach, I mean, you can publish your games on the App Store, you can even pass green light and, and publish games on Steam or whatever. It's just like uh, I think a lot of people are discovering that there are uh, a huge number of players around the world that want to play point-and-click adventure games. Not only point-and-click, you know, like um, old-school point-and-click adventure games, but games like, uh, like you said, The Walking Dead or, you know, the Telltale games that maybe are not uh, old school adventure games but they have things from the adventure games so that's one factor and another one is that uh, we love story driven games we love adventure games and uh, it was it's the genre we were more used to so you know it's just like we felt like we could make an adventure game and uh, and maybe we're not that used to to other genres so it was like it's a favorite game a favorite genre it's the genre we enjoy the most so it, it was the first choice so you mentioned that this is actually the first project for your team. Have you guys individually worked on other previous titles in the past or just smaller projects or did you end up going to school for game design? Uh, well, not actually. In fact, uh, well, uh, the three brothers have always have uh, uh, you know, expertise in other matters related to video games. For instance, uh, Mario, who is a programmer, has always been uh, a web programmer. So he knew how to program, of course. Uh, my brother, uh, other brother Alberto, who is the writer and the musician, has always written, you know, short novels and tales and writes music and writes the lyrics. And I've been always keen on media, you know, in fact, uh, uh, audiovisual media and, and communication departments, and and I've uh, you know made some short films and things like that. So we had no direct experience in video games. But we are always, we have always been keen on video games, and, and, and our job has always been related to that in some way or another. And only our artist, Martin, who is the only one who is not family, uh, had previous experience uh, on video games, and he had worked in several projects. So for the three of us, it's our first uh, professional contact with video games. Something I can definitely say about this game is that it really is spot on when it comes to the way it looks and its music. You can actually pick up the game's soundtrack. I believe you can pick that up separately or with the game. I don't remember if they, that comes with the game automatically. But the soundtrack is actually, I've enjoyed what's been in it so far. Of course, I've only heard a small part of it because we're only at the beginning of the game. And the artwork, the game definitely does have its own style. I can see a little bit of other styles in it, but I can't really say that there is another game I can think of off the top of my head that particularly looks like this. 
Yes, uh, the soundtrack uh, can be acquired as well on Google Games. So uh, we, we're very, very happy with that soundtrack. In fact, um, one of my brothers, Alberto, who is the composer, has a band with my other brother, you know, a band called Kowalski, a rock band called Kowalski. And uh, they have performed the, the soundtrack for the game. And uh, they've been influenced by the Giallo soundtracks, you know, the Italian horror movies from the 70s, the Giallos, and uh, from the instrumental soundtrack of the 70s and, you know, lots of influences. So um, whether Although Kowalski had never made music like this, it's like the mood of the, of the music is very uh, similar to what they were doing before, they were composing before. So it's been quite easy for them to adapt their style to the game. And uh, we have got really great feedback about the game, about the, the music of the game. Um, you know, we're very happy about that because for us, uh, the music, the plot, and the art are the three main elements of our game. In fact, as I told you, you can buy the game on Google Games. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, not only the game, but the soundtrack as well. And uh, we feel like the players are, are liking the game, the soundtrack. So you did talk about how the game is available on GOG, and that brings up the question, why uh, bring the game out for DRM free? Um, well, why not? Um, we, we ran a Kickstarter campaign a year ago, and uh, it was one of the things that uh, we find that players were very keen on. You know, it's just like, well, it's your game, you can download it, you don't have to be connected. Just like, well, why not? I mean, uh, we, we, we think that uh, when, you, uh, when you like a game, you eventually buy it. So why not offering the game, the, the player, that, that chance? Uh, you mentioned your Kickstarter. I remember playing the demo for this game uh, a long time ago, about a, about a year or so ago. Um, the Kickstarter demo, because I was thinking about maybe trying to get in contact, with, in contact with you guys then, but unfortunately I never actually get to um, set that up. But that was that, that was your first thing with Kickstarter. How did you feel about it going? Well, uh, we were very excited because... Um, we had um, read a lot of things about Kickstarter. We were backers of a lot of projects, and we felt like it was going to be a very, very intense work. You know, so we decided to browse dozens and dozens of uh, previous campaigns, so that uh, we can check. We could check what uh, worked for them and what didn't work for them. So we tried to to take the best of of the campaigns we we browsed. Uh, it was a very, very intense month. Uh, running a Kickstarter campaign is, is very hard because you have to be like um, posting all the time, um, making a really, really intense work on social networks and uh, communicating everything about your game and your campaign. You know, it's like 30 days of, of really intense work. But it was awesome, you know, because we got a lot of feedback from backers and players because. At the same time, we, we launched the, the campaign, we released uh, our first demo, so it was the first time players can, can play the game. So we got a lot of feedback. Um, the game gained a lot of uh, visibility, you know, of popularity. Well, not a lot, of course, but more than, more than ever before. And, um, and when we, the campaign um, eventually succeeded. So it was perfect for us, you know, it was like uh, after all the work of uh, making the campaign, running the campaign, uh, it was like the result was great. And well, uh, the game is done now thanks to our backers, uh, thanks to the media that spread the word about the campaign, thanks to everyone who retweeted and posted things on Facebook. And so we want to thank, thank them all because the game wouldn't have been finished without them. Now, you do mention that the Kickstarter was successful, but when the game opens, you can see that the Deadlick Entertainment logo is actually on it. So this game does actually have a publisher. You weren't able to, or you decided not to, create the entire game on your own. Why work with a publisher after the Kickstarter? Well, uh, after succeeding the Kickstarter, uh, we felt like we could finish the game, you know, because we decided a very realistic 
uh, campaign. So we asked for the exact exact amount of money we needed to finish the game, and it was it was awesome, you know, because uh, it was uh, great not to have to worry about extra funding to finish the game. But uh, well, several publishers contacted us uh, during during that time. One of them was Daedalic, whose games we absolutely love, you know, and. Um, well, one of the one of the advantages of working with with the Dalek is that uh, because of them, the game has full voiceover, for instance, both in English and German, and uh, the game has texts in a lot of languages, six different languages. Uh, we could only uh, have afforded to, to feature the game with English and Spanish text, and not with full uh, voiceover. And of course, uh, thanks to the Dalek, well, the game is like. Uh, they, they helped us with the design and and with the, uh, some doubts about the interface. You know, their expertise has been really, really useful to us. So it was like uh, once we knew that the game was going to be released, we decided to go with them because we knew the game was going to feel more alive and more of a better game with with their help. That's definitely understandable. So just to remind the chat, if anybody happens to have any questions for Lewis about the game or Kickstarter or anything dealing with um, the company at the moment, feel free to leave those in chat and I'll pass those on to him so that we can try to get everybody's question asked. And if I miss it, he's looking at chat as well, so he'll be able to try to see them and if he sees anything, he'll go ahead and try to answer it. So it definitely makes sense to work with them when you get uh, the voice acting. And the voice acting is actually, it, it, it's pretty good. Um, did you have much involvement in that or did they that like mostly cover that? No, we were lucky to be involved in the process um, that we could uh, uh, choose the voices from you know from some uh, offer you know from uh, a previous casting and uh, Alberto uh, one of uh, my brothers uh, attended uh, the, the voiceover recording in Hamburg in Germany and it was really interesting, you know, because it was the first time we were involved in such a process like that. And um, it was great to meet the, the, the actors, you know. Uh, for instance, Michael's voice, which uh, belongs to an actor called Jeremiah Costello, is a really deep and intense voice. And it was great to be here, to be there, to, you know, to uh, help with our opinion. And, you know, in fact, Alberto is the author of the, of the script, so he knows exactly how the characters are and how they should sound. So it was like uh, directing, uh, you know, actors in a movie or something, because it was like, okay, here a little louder, a little softer, a little, you know, it was, it was great landing there. In fact, I feel quite envy because I, I, I couldn't go there, <laughs> but I would have liked, of course, because it's like, you know, feeling that like your game is, is going alive, you know, once the, the, the characters speak and you hear them speaking, it's like the game feels more alive than ever. And in fact, we felt a huge difference between playing the game before, voice acting, and after. You know, it's just like um, the, the, the environment feels uh, alive, feels vibrant. I definitely like to see games that have a lot of voice acting. I'm a bit of a freelance voice actor myself. So I try to do things when I can. So anytime that uh, I see a game that's definitely got voice acting, it's something I'm able to quickly pick up on. And this game is actually, it, it, it does a really good job. You, you did a pretty good job when it came to casting the characters. And a lot of the voices fit the characters, which is something that some games have a lot of issues with. And I haven't even moved. I don't understand. Sorry, I, I think I didn't get you. I'm sorry. I'm just saying that the, the voices for the characters actually really work with each other, whereas some games, sometimes uh, the person that you cast for a spe specific character, uh, they don't really fit, seem to fit the character when you're actually playing the game. But in this game oh. so far, the voices seem to actually fit the character's design and who they're supposed to be. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, we're very careful with that. In fact... Uh... Uh, characters like Michael or Rose or the Hunter, we we feel like um, the voices have uh, uh, have a lot of feeling, you know. It's just like they are very very similar to the ones we had in mind when we were uh, when Alberto was writing the script and we were developing the game, or when where Martin was designing the characters or the backgrounds. So we're very happy with with them. Uh, and we've been lucky to have a casting that um, you know, matched the, the characters quite a lot. 
I apologize for my phone going off in the background. Those of you who are uh, regulars here on GOG Chat know that nobody likes to call me unless I'm doing something. So I, I, I'm, I definitely am sorry about that. Um, hopefully that won't be too much of a distraction as we go through the rest of the game. But a lot of this game so far that I've played, I haven't seen much in the way of puzzles. Most of it has just been talking to people and learning about the environment. Is there are, are there a lot of the puzzles when it comes to uh, dead synchronicity? Synchronicity. I say that wrong every single time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you're gonna you're gonna solve the puzzle before the the, the podcast ends. Oh no, I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, there are a lot of puzzles, and in fact, we want to we wanted to make a game in which the story and the puzzles were uh, perfectly intertwined. I mean, for us, it's very important that puzzles are not just obstacles and not like fences that stops the story from progressing, but puzzles should be uh, part of the story itself. So we've tried to not to add puzzles just because, you know, just, just because so the player can't access a part of the story or the game, but because uh, by solving those puzzles, uh, Michael... Ha has is being defined. One of the things about the story is that Michael starts like an amnesiac. He can't remember anything when the story starts. Uh, some people are saying that that's like an overused cliche, and of course it's it's a cliche. I mean, uh, an amnesic character is quite common, but in in the synchronicity of the world comes today, it's um, we think it's uh, quite. Uh, you know, like, like it matches the story because of two things. First, there's a reason for Michael to be amnesiac. I can't, I, I don't want to make spoilers here, but there's a reason for that. And secondly, uh, since the player, when, when the player starts uh, playing the game, they don't know anything about Michael. They don't know how he is. They don't know anything about his past, you know. So we wanted those puzzles to define Michael's personality. And in fact, one of the key, one of the key things for us in, of the game, one of the key themes of the game, is that uh, the player will have to perform really hard things, disturbing things, to make the plot uh, move forward. And in fact, those actions are taken, are, are performed by Michael, of course, but by the player themselves. So it was a way like uh, you, the, the player go on knowing who Michael is, but because the player is performing specific action, disgusting actions. So it was like both processes are parallel processes, and we felt like very, you know, like very interesting that the player themselves were the ones defining Michael's personality. So does that mean that there are multiple ways to kind of get through areas of the game that you can kind of figure out for yourself and let the player find, or are the puzzles the the, the classic um, only one solution? No, there, there's in fact there's no there's no parallel ways to solve puzzles. Usually there's only one way. There there's some moments uh, in which you can make some decisions about doing and not doing things, you know, but we leave that to a player to, to discover them. But it, it's usually a quite linear story. But uh, the things you have to do to solve puzzles are, you know, like not, not very common in that way. I mean, it's not a question, only a question of being, uh, you know, like clever or whatever, so that you can find how to solve a puzzle, which is great, you know, it's very comforting. But those actions, are defining Michael's personality, and uh, well, we can tell that some of the things you you will have to do to solve the game are you know very very unpleasant. So this game is split in half. The first half, tomorrow comes today, is currently out right now. But the second half is still in development. What was the decision to split the game in half instead of releasing the full project? Well, uh, we, we made that decision long ago. In fact, we have a development blog in our website, www.fixuremap.com. Um, and uh, it, there's a very, very old post talking about that. And the thing is that, well, we decided to go on with the game. We decided to go on with a project and make a point and click, a, click adventure game based on the Dead Synchronicity story. And then we uh, found out that it was very big. So the story was very big. So uh, we had to decide whether to remove things from the plot, you know, remove characters, remove locations, remove puzzles, remove, you know, and make a much shorter game, or to split the game in two. 
it was it was very hard to decide, you know. But we felt like uh, the game had, uh, you know, a very specific plot and, and, and lots of interesting characters that uh, put a lot of value into the game. So we felt like removing all those characters and locations would be, you know, a pity. In fact, uh, well, the, the the first part. Tomorrow Comes Today takes part in a concentration camp and then a city and then more more locations I can't talk about. But, you know, most of them should have been removed from the game. And we felt like, you know, it made no sense to, to cut the game, to, to, to remove so many things of the game because it wouldn't have been the same game. So we decided to split it in two. We thought it was the more, you know, the more positive things to do in that, in, at that moment. And well, this, this plot, this game tells the, the first half of the Death Synchronizer story. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm, I hate to have to, uh, to do this already. But I'm actually a little bit stuck. <laughs> I don't well. really know what to do. Which actually brings up the question. A lot of modern point-and-click adventure games, um, the last one that I played, I think was one called Randall's Monday. And a couple ones before that, such as Macharium. Um, Macharium? Macharium. Machinarium. Machinarium. That's how you say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. They actually a had a bit of a built-in hint system that you could use in Machinaria, and you had to kind of play a mini game to unlock it. In Randall's Monday, you just had to click a button to unlock it. And I think the Inner World was another one that had a built-in hint system. But they're like, they, they specifically say, are you sure you want to use the hint system? But does, yeah. uh, does this game have a built-in hint system or do you have to figure everything out on your own? Well, we have two, two different systems to help the player. One of them is in every location, when you have nothing selected, if you press the space bar, every hotspot in the location will highlight uh, that is. Okay. So in, maybe you missed examining something or taking something or whatever. So that's a way to help you to not, not to forget about any hotspot in, in, the, in the location. And the other one is the, the notebook you have in your inventory right now. If you, if you examine the notebook you have, uh, you will discover it's... Um, it's both a narrative, uh, yeah, right click there. It's both a narrative element because on the first page there are things written by the previous owner of the notebook, which is Rod, and there are several lines written by him, just like a diary. It, that that parts were written by Rod, mm -hmm. but the things written in the, in the following pages is where Michael writes like the, his goals. Okay, so I have to do this to get that. Maybe I should leave the camp, but to do that I need something. Okay, so. It's it's half a hint system and half like a reminder because as players we have experienced that uh, feeling of uh, playing a point and click adventure game today and then uh, uh, leaving it apart for I don't know three or four days and then you resume your your game and you hardly remember anything. It's like oh what. What, what, I, what did I have to do? What, what was my goal? Uh, who was this character? So we wanted to make it easier for the players to remember the point where they left the game. So those two elements are the, only, the, the hint systems of the game. But we don't have a hint system like, oh, please help me. So you better should do, do this or that. You know, we, we don't have that. Because we think that you know, nowadays uh, there's, there are walkthroughs for, for you for games on YouTube or whatever from day one, you know, just like you can find a walkthrough and videos and let's plays. So it was like, well, maybe there's no need to do that, you know, because you can find help everywhere else. I definitely like the idea of it showing the hot spots around the area instead of being all out, hey, go do this. That's something that a lot of point-to-click adventure games, or basically any point-to-click adventure game, has had an issue with, and that's making sure players can notice what are important things and what aren't. Some games do it very simply and a little bit too easy by basically throwing the stuff in your face. Other games, it's kind of difficult. You kind of have to paint the screen to figure out, paint the screen with your cursor to figure out the exact little pixel you need to click on so being able to see where all the hot spots are just right off the bat by holding on the space bar is definitely very helpful yes we, we think it's great too you know because uh, uh 
we, we know players that don't like that system, you know, really old school players that they want to discover everything by themselves. And they're free to do, you know. They, the only thing they don't have to do is press, is press space bar, you know, and okay, they will play the game like in old school way. You know? But uh, it's true that um, we have tried to make like seamless integration between the hotspots and the locations. So sometimes it can be difficult, okay. That's, that's a challenge itself. So, okay, but of course, if you want to have some help from the game, you only have to press spacebar. So you will be sure that you have not forgotten to examine a hotspot or an item or whatever. So in fact, we, we usually use that system in other games in which it's, it's, it's uh, integrated, you know. And we think it's very, very useful, you know, very, very handy. Yeah, someone in the chat um, pointed out that it's uh, similar to the Deponia series. In Dead Lake Entertainment, they, that's the same company I don't know if they developed the Pony, but I know they definitely published it. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's the same system they use in uh, the Dali using their games, not not only the Dali but other other companies, and we think it's it's very very useful because uh, well we have tried to make our hotspots uh, big enough, so it's it's not a you know it's not an impossible task to locate them, but as I told you the game feels alive, so maybe there are new hotspots that appear in a, in a location, and uh, of course you. you if you can't remember how the location looked before, maybe it could be hard for you to find them. So with that option of the space bar, it's very fast to discover if something new have happened. Okay, things are kind of going to crap at the moment. This, I really hmm. like this sort of, um, it's sort of, I don't know what's necessarily called, the VHS kind of static going across the screen. It's definitely a very foreboding thing and almost makes me think that Michael might just be imagining everything that's going on and when in the string it's static that's what everything actually looks like. Oh, you'll have to play further to to discover if you're right. I'm, I'm I'm not going to tell you, but yeah, it was it was an effect we wanted to implement because um, we've been very careful to offer a uh, very, uh, at some extent, of course, very dynamic experience when you play the game. Uh, usually point of point and click adventures only offer one point of view, you know, and the sprite is the same size during all the game. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we have tried to make zooms, for instance, when you start a conversation, there's a, there's a zoom. Um, uh, when Michael is thinking about something, there's a close up, so you can see his face is uh, in, a, in a really big, big signs. Uh, there are split screen effects. There are locations that overimpose other locations. There are other locations like this one you're, you're playing right now, which is like almost a frame, you know, Michael uh, looking from the outside. So we have tried to offer that dynamic, dynamic experience to, you know, to make the, the, the game like more, more vibrant, more, more alive. And in that effect you were talking about, it's some of the mysteries of the game, and uh, uh, you can you can skip them uh, pressing the ESC key, okay, in case you, you feel tired of them, because they happen from time to time, and uh, they're part of the plot, so everyone who plays the game until the end will know what I'm talking about. Something else that I specifically like about the game, I really like how I can double-click on an exit, and it'll automatically take me to the next screen. <laughs> There are a lot of older games where you always had to click and wait, and just like Michael, a lot of the characters don't really have that fast of movement. So being able to quickly go through an area, in a lot of point-click adventure games, the same with this one, there are a lot of different environments to see, but you're only really put in, in one environment at a time, at least right now. I don't know about how later in the game uh, for this particular title. But a lot of point-to-click adventure games, you're putting in one small area at a time. And it can be rather annoying to have to walk around through the same areas over and over and over and over again, especially if you don't have a faster way to get through them. So I really like being able to just double-click on an exit and be able to go to the next screen. Yes, uh, well, as I told you, uh, we, we grew up playing games, playing uh, adventure games, uh, but we have never stopped from playing adventure games. So, well, to be honest, what we have done is to take what we considered the best of the adventures we liked. In fact, in our, um, in our blog, fakeshurama.com, we have a section we, which we called Inspirational Reviews. 
in which we talk about games that we that has inspired us some way or some way or the other, and that double click system uh, uh, has been implemented in a lot of, of adventure games before. And we also think it's a very quick way to to move between locations. So you know, it was like we had to implement it. Uh, I'm reading some of the messages in. in uh, in the chat, and uh, I see some some users are asking about, you know, it's it's an episodic game, is it a sequel or whatever? Okay, I'd like to maybe I didn't explain myself uh, well. Um, you know, in this first game, tomorrow comes today. When you start playing it, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of questions raised. Okay, so and I don't want to to talk about spoilers, but uh, well, it's in everywhere that there's been a series of catastrophes, and there's an illness, and Michael doesn't know who he is, and uh, there's a voice, a female voice, talking uh, into his head. And okay, so uh, when we decided to split the game in two, we are very careful to offer uh, what we consider a fulfilling experience. So once you start playing the game, uh, you have all these questions in your mind as a player, and once this that synchronicity tomorrow comes today part ends, all those questions are answered. Okay, so you know about the the great wave and the illness and, and all these things, but another very interesting narrative branch opens in the end, and that is the part left. Okay, so. Uh, you know, some people tell, but well, this is an episodic game, you know, like these short one-hour games, like, oh no, it's it's not that at all, okay? So our game can be played in, I don't know, five, six, seven, uh, seven or even uh, eleven hours, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a player told us today that he sat and he um, stood playing the game for eleven hours until he finished it. And uh, so... That's we dedication think that right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. When you hear that, when you hear that, you know, being a developer, it's great. You know, you feel fulfilled. So it, it's it's not that kind of short episodic game. You know, it's just it's just two parts, and we have uh, made our best to to offer a fulfilling experience with this one. I hate to have to ask you to tell me what in the world to do, but. As I've been spending the past, oh, I don't know, a half hour walking around this camp not knowing what to do, I think it uh, might be time to actually make some progress. Oh, sure. Okay. I so, got I got uh, beer cans. That's the last thing that I did that actually made progress. Sure. Uh, go back to the uh, to the camp exit. It's about two clicks. Yeah. Now and and then another one. And uh, well, when you reach this location for the first time, you may have missed that on the left there's another location you move to the left yeah no no not there just click just click uh, okay there uh, the first oh, the, the screen f scrolls okay the first time you enter this location there's a this is scroll so that you can see that door oh okay. all right M maybe you missed it the first I time did you missed yeah. that i only saw yeah. that um it scrolled at all when I went over here to click on the thing for the the saddle yeah. bag, and he walked over. There's a motorbike. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Unless you visit that other location, I mean, I'm afraid you you are not going to be able to leave the camp. All right. So I haven't actually gone here yet. Okay. So I and that's this will hopefully give me a little bit of progress as we're going on. Our, our yeah, I'm program. sure that now you're going to be you know able to leave the camp. Uh, that's a very interesting character. Uh, as you see, she's not very friendly. Uh, yeah, she's she's really uh, she's really angry and um, well, she's called Misha, M I S H A, and uh, she's called that way after one of my cats. I own two cats, and uh, and one of one of my cats is, is called Misha because she's very fierce. You know, she's like uh, screaming and and she when when she doesn't want to be caressed or whatever, it's like she she shows you his. Her, her teeth and so when we had to choose a name for for this character we chose Misha uh, you know after our cat so it's a very special in fact uh, my all my two cats are featured in the game uh, later on and they're of very great importance to solve a puzzle so uh, they are there it's always important to include your cats in your game sure we did we, we certainly did <laughs> a couple of people are talking about the volume, so I'll turn the volume up just a little bit. I don't want it to be really loud because I still want um, to be able to hear 
the developer over the game. And I guess I can turn myself up a little bit because people are saying a little bit that I'm a little bit quiet. So I can turn it up a little bit too much. I'm always afraid of peaking my microphone. Okay, now, now I turn it a bit, a bit softer, maybe. We should okay. be... Let me know in chat took away from this how that is. And song? of course, anybody who has any questions for Lewis, feel free to put those in chat, and I'll try to um, send those over to him, or if he sees them himself, he'll be able to, to answer those as quickly as you possibly can. So, you've mentioned that someone has put 11 hours... Was that into this... Uh, part of the game, or was that into both parts? No, no, just just this part of the game. No, the now this this uh, only that synchronized motor comes today has been developed yet. So no, on, only this part. Yeah. There was uh, someone asking earlier in chat if there are any plans on a release date or release schedule for the second part of the game. Oh no, no not yet. Now we're we're focused on the release of this this part tomorrow comes today, so we have no uh, release date yet for for the second part. But uh, I can tell you, you're gonna enjoy uh, tomorrow comes today. And is the second part going to be kind of uh, more of a DLC thing? Is it going to be added to this game when it's finished, or is it going to be sold as a separate title altogether? Oh, well, it's, maybe it's, it's too soon to decide, but uh, we think it's going to be sold as an independent game, because uh, as I tell you, when we had to decide where to, where to cut the game, we were very careful to, to uh, offer like two different complete games you know, that can be enjoyed themselves. Uh, one or both. Uh, of course, the players that play two parts, the two parts are going to have the more fulfilling experience, of course, because they're going to know lots of things about the plot. But we have been very careful to choose where to cut the story. How is your husband? That was something that I was watching. I was watching the uh, the the background documentary that Double Fine's putting up on their YouTube channel for Broken Age, and that's something that they were talking about when they decided to split their game as well, trying to find that point to split it in half so that it doesn't feel like you're giving away too much and it's a it's a, it's a fine it's a uh, I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say here it's a, it's a difficult decision to make um, when it comes to splitting the game in half and finding that exact point where there's still enough of the story that you can tell people that, that and that um, yeah it's difficult yeah. to do <laughs> I'm sorry yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm rambling at this point no, no, I, I got you. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's very difficult because uh, you know it's just like you have to you have to offer, as I told you, a fulfilling experience, and uh, it's like you can't leave things unanswered, and uh, and yet you have to you have to show that this left of the story uh, to be told. So uh, in fact, we have to arrange things of the story, you know, like tweaking here and there, so that uh, that point to split was the the most appropriate one but yeah it was, it was really very difficult we, we made that decision about two years ago and um we have we, have, we thought we, we did it uh, we did it right you know because uh, as i told you every answer in the game is uh, every a a question in the game is, is answered but of course once you reach the end of the game it's like hey i want to keep playing you know but yes that's another story so even though Dead Synchronicity, I probably said it wrong again. Um, even though it is inspired by a lot of the older games, you have given it a bit more of a modern flair, not only with its looks, but also with, also with its mechanics. You don't have, uh, I think it's called like a, a verb section or a verb page where you have to go down, click, look at, and then click on an item. You can kind of just click on things in general. Was that any? It was any kind of. Um, Decision making going on when you were just figuring out exactly how you wanted people to interact with the world around them, or did you automatically want to have that where you click one button and you look at it, you click another button, you interact with it? Uh, you mean about this, uh, deciding about the interface, the left click and right click? Right, yes. Okay, yeah, it was a decision we, we made at the very beginning. Uh, we feel like one of the um, uh, trends in adventure games is to make uh, sim more simple interfaces all the time, you know. In fact, if we if you go back to the games of the 90s and you find games uh, with a SCOM interface, uh, lots of verbs and different actions, and uh, in the beginning there was uh, no items depicted, only the names of the items, and it's just like everything um, 
we feel like everything has to be easier, you know. So we decided to make it very, very simple, just two clicks. One click to examine and another click to use or pick up or talk or whatever. And uh, we, we decided to, to design the whole game with that interface in mind so that uh, every interaction, every puzzle should, could be solved only with, with two clicks and, of course, the interface. Uh, I have to say that to solve some of the puzzles, you have to interact with other characters in a specific way. So uh, there's no dialogue puzzles, to call them somehow. But of course, you have to get some information, and sometimes you have to talk to, to, to choose the right line to make other things happen. So only with those two clicks and choosing lines of interface, you can solve all the whole game. Well, I definitely appreciate it over the really old school way of telling people stuff where you had the line that you had to input the commands into. And good luck trying to figure the commands out with things like uh, the, the really old Sierra games with uh, Space Quest and King's Quest and that kind of stuff. Yes, in fact, well, I see one of the users tells that, of course, yeah, later Scum games uh, got a lot simpler and better interface, yeah, that's true. But going back to those text adventure games you, you said, uh, when we released our... Uh, during our Kickstarter campaign, we announced another game based on the Dead Synchronicity uh, universe, which is going to be some kind of, of sequel of Dead Synchronicity Tomorrow Comes Today, and it's going to be a text adventure game. Uh, first, it's going to be available for our backers, you know, the eligible backers, and then it's going to be uh, you know, released for free. And uh, we're very excited about that before, but because before playing adventure games, we, we played text uh, text games. So we have been replaying old text uh, adventures to you know to get that mood and to you know to be able to to replicate the kind of puzzles that those games featured. So it's been very exciting because it, we've been playing games that we haven't played in the last I don't know 15 or, or 20 years, and uh, it's been it's been great to. To recall, to, to to remember that sometimes those puzzles were based not only in performing the right action, but on choosing the right word. You know, and sometimes it's really hard to to be in the designer's mind to be able to guess which exact word they had in mind when they were trying to to design a puzzle. And we have to make things easier, but we guess um, in the end it's very difficult to, to avoid that, you know, because you can't use every word, every single word in the dictionary, you know, and every synonym or whatever, you have to choose just one of them. Yeah, the old Zork games were nigh impossible to figure out what in the world you were supposed to do and what words actually did what they were they were rather difficult games not just to figure out what to do but to figure out what to say <laughs> yes yes we have we have faced the same uh, feeling now that we are replaying text adventures we have replaying um spanish text adventures you know because uh uh, it, they were the ones we played when we were teenagers. Uh, there was a very, very famous company in Spain called AD that made great adventure games based on the um, uh, English and American sex adventures. And uh, we have been replaying um, the, the, the games by AD, AD games. And uh, we have felt the same, you know, just like, oh my God, I know how to solve this puzzle, but I don't know which exact word to use. And finally, after trying three or four, after looking in a dictionary or whatever, you finally find the right word. And he goes, oh, oh. at least my vocabulary has increased, you know, has improved. Yeah. That's definitely something a lot of older games have issues with, such as Shadowgate and those really old ones where there was that weird transition where everyone was trying to figure out how do we easily make people know what we want them to know. So I'm very glad to see that you guys were able to figure out a very easy and simple way for people to be able to interact with the world around them and de dead synchronicity. And... Something that I want to ask is, um, you were talking about the that you're making a text adventure game, and that you also have a, have the second part of Dead Synchronicity. Do you is Dead Synchronicity a bit of like a universe that you plan on making multiple titles in, or is it just a series that you're focusing on right now? Because there are a couple developers out there. There's, there's one of them in particular whose name eludes me. That they only make games in one universe. Every game that they make is always in the exact same universe, and it's more of an expansion upon that universe. Oh well, well. Uh, to be honest, we we haven't thought about that yet. Um, 
now we, as I told you, we're focusing on, on this part of the game. Uh, the next game that will be released uh, will be this small sequel, you know. And uh, you know, after making these three games about that synchronicity, you know, the, this one, the next part, and this small sequel, uh, we don't know exactly. You know, we have lots of projects, lots of ideas. You know, the, the good thing about being such a tiny company. We're just four people working in the same room and spending uh, lots and lots of hours every week. Is that it's very easy to share your thoughts and your ideas, and it's very easy to say, "Oh, that's a really bad idea. Oh, that's interesting. Let's write it down." You know, just like we're trying things all the time. And one of the things we really feel happy about the process of making that synchronization the more come today, it's that we have tried dozens of things all the time you know just like someone came up with an idea let's try this okay let's do it so have maybe the, the developer mario spent half an hour trying it and then we saw it and it, oh no, it doesn't work let's move on but other times it was a great idea you know and it happened just like that okay just like let's try this and uh we think that uh, in great companies making triple a games that's really harder you know because you, just to make something you have to come to ask lots of people about you and then you you know we have friends that work in in big companies and things are very very difficult very different of course Hello, not okay. better not worse but what can you know, very different you? so do you, do, you, do you want me to help you do you want me to tell you a hint or whatever i i have an idea of what i need to do i need to okay. trade the whiskey for food Unfortunately, I yeah. wasn't paying attention to what the bartender was saying when I tried that earlier, so I'm not. I gotta go and um, reread through that to get that back again. Which I do like how care. I kind of do and don't like when characters repeat themselves. It's useful for figuring things out, but it's also not like very realistic. So I do kind of appreciate a situation like this that you can go back and a character will repeat what they said previously. <sighs> Yes, uh, we, we have implemented that way of, of you know, like, uh, deeming some options. In fact, uh, the, the options, the line of text you already said are in gray color, and the new, all the new or, um, uh, uh, you know, the important things, the things you have to say are in white yet. So, you know, it's very easy to know if you set a line or hmm. if you set it if it's still important and because we we hate that too you know when you read a conversation and you, you, you don't know if you you have to start over asking for everything or, over and over you know so we've tried to implement that that hint it's just like okay if you see something in gray it means that you ask it before and it's not um indispensable to to finish the game you know how it works we accept everything cash jewelry liquor tobacco um yeah, you gave them the bottle of whiskey, but I think you're going to need something else. I'm going to need something else, which scares me, because the only thing I also have are empty beer cans, and they don't seem to be interested in empty beer cans. Uh, did you did you visit the child, the children? I did. I thought I talked to them, but maybe I missed something while I was you, you, there. Uh, there's a direct exit to the to the house from the previous location. Uh, maybe it's quicker, but anyway, you can enter, you can enter that way. Okay. And those are, uh, you can see the children there, and they're trying to improve their, their, their skills. So you can help them, maybe they will help you in return. They're looking for a real target to improve their marksmanship. And uh, maybe you have in your inventory right now something that may be very handy for them, you know. Oh, I was thinking for a moment that I would have to be a live target. Get lost, rat. <laughs> well, <laughs> not necessarily. Uh, what I can I can't tell you, but they're gonna hit a living target sooner or later. But yeah, I think they will manage with that for the moment. All right, I think the empty beer can probably get the job done. Yeah. Yeah, so now they're going to improve their skills. So now you're going to be able to ask for help. Let's see now when the dialogue opens again, if you can see the, red, the, the right line. Let's see now. Somebody was mentioning this a little bit earlier, and I definitely have to say that something that this game does really well is it's, even though it does have voice acting, you decided to have the, the words and the text boxes along as well, which is good because some of these characters, like the the old man you talked to at the beginning of the game who's sitting outside the trailer, 
His voice acting, while it really does fit his character and it's really good, it's also sometimes hard to understand because his voice is very, very gravelly. So yeah. you have the ability to read what you can't necessarily discern from hearing. And something was people were talking about this earlier that it's it's a, the font you guys picked and the colors you picked for the words really stand out against the background. Something that some older point of click adventure games have some issues with is when it comes to the text boxes and the color of the text being very similar to the color of the text in the background. So it can be difficult to actually read it. It's actually very, very clear in this game, and I like that a lot. Well, thank you. In fact, it, it was, you know, it, it's not the kind of things that uh, when, when, when you start designing a game, you start developing a game, um, I mean, you, you never question that when you're not developing. I mean, it, it's supposed to work that way, you know, because then, but, but, not, but then when you start developing a game, you realize that you have to choose, you know, <laughs> you have to choose the colors, you have to choose the, the, the border, you have to choose the shadow of the, of the text, you have to choose a lot of things that are usually right when you play games. You say, oh, okay, so I have to choose colors, okay, let's choose colors. And you find out it's very difficult, you know. And uh, in fact, uh, in the game there, are, I can't remember the exact name, the exact number, but I think it, there are about 30 characters. I can't remember if that's right. So we couldn't find 30 colors, you know, for uh, a color for each character. So what we did is to choose. I think there's there are up to five, six, or seven colors, which we found were you know very clear, like you know white and yellow and pink and uh, light blue and, and so light green, I think and use them so we found that that was the best way to to get everyone from reading the, the, the text you know, in, in an easy way yeah that's definitely something you can have an issue with especially when you're dealing with very colorful backgrounds which this game has when it's trying to find uh, a text color that will work across all the colors that they're going to be covering in the background yeah, yeah, that, that's a problem. In fact, it's the same problem that happens with subtitles and sometimes in, in, in some films when you when you see that they have chosen a very weird color and then you realize that in certain backgrounds you can't read the text, you can hardly read the text. So yes, it, it's it's a very it's a very important decision. Yeah. Uh, now you need something else. Um, if you go back into the house, uh, you, you, maybe you can find an object you haven't realized, and uh, you'll be able to leave the camp soon, I promise. If you go back into the house, I'll give you a little hint. I think hotspots might be enough for me to figure out exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, if you I look like at the, the other I, I like the hotspots. I'm not used to... I haven't played much in the way of Daedalus games, so I'm not used to being able to see hotspots all over the place. And I definitely, I like them as opposed to flat out hints. I can say that much. I, I, I don't like when it, the way that I uh, gauge point to click adventure games is based upon how much do I have to use a walkthrough to finish it. <laughs> so if, if, if it's a game that I can, I can understand without having to look up a walkthrough or find a hint, that's something that I can appreciate, and I don't consider hot spots to be a hint, because just because no. you can click on it doesn't mean you know what you need to click on it for. Oh, sure, I, I agree with you. In fact, um, no, using the right thing, and now, uh, yeah, wait a minute, okay, so a new hot spot appears. Uh, yeah, it's close to the, to the other one. If, if you press the if you press the space bar, the space bar now, you will realize there's a new hot spot. Oh, okay, you see. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now you have it. Okay. It's gonna. It's not going to be that easy anyway if you try to pick it up. But anyway, you can try. In fact, you have to try. Uh, yeah. About the difficulty, we have tried to find a balance, you know, between the old school adventure games like Monkey Island or playing uh, games like that, that those, that were that were very difficult, in fact. And we find that uh, nowadays. No one is going to spend, I don't know, a whole summer, summer vacations to finish a game like Monkey Island because that's what we did when we were teenagers, you know, spent months and months to finish a game. And one of the things that made those um, games difficult 
was the extension, you know, that free Roman feeling that I was talking before. There were lots of violence, lots of locations, lots of characters, lots of puzzles. So it was really, really difficult. And we feel like today it's very uh, difficult for someone to spend so many time in, 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 in an adventure game. So much time as well. So we have tried to, you know, to some extent, uh, find a proper balance. You know, our game is quite open, loaded, you know, uh, 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 between quotation marks. I mean, that open, uh, but not as big as uh, Monkey Island to these kind of things. You know, first because we can't do it. You know, we're four people. But secondly, because we feel like that would have made the game much, much difficult. So we have, we have tried to make a game that, you know, everyone can finish. Maybe you'll get stuck in, I don't know, two, three, four parts of the game. But fi eventually you're going to find a solution. Right. Hello, Michael. So I'm okay, now thinking you that I need to get the kids to distract her so I can grab the cigarettes. Oh, you're absolutely right, yeah. <laughs> I need your help. I'm figuring it out. You did it. I'm figuring it out. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad because that's the kind of thing as I was talking about, okay? So maybe you can stuck here and there, but eventually you stop a moment and you think and you praise the space bar and get, we think you, you'll finally get it. You, of course, the players. Now, somebody earlier in chat um, made a comment that all the characters seem to have their eyes closed. And they asked if that was a specific uh, design when it came to designing the characters or if everyone seems to communicate via echolocation. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a decision made from the very beginning. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the first things we we decided was Michael's design. You know, we started designing Michael and uh, one of the location. Well, that's a cutscene, and this is one of those uh, visions Michael has from time to time. Uh, you pay attention to these cutscenes. In fact, these cutscenes are. Are, you can you can replay these cutscenes from the notebook. So, as as I, as I told, in the notebook uh, appears the um, are featured the Ma Michael's goals, but you can see these cutscenes again. This this patience. So um, I was I was saying um, I don't know what I was talking about. You were talking about. I think. I, Cutscenes, I think? I hope Rod helps. <laughs> no, I, I think I started to talk about cutscenes because I see I saw this one. <laughs> Maybe a spoiler alert. Like, but I was talking earlier about how I like the visuals and during that cutscene that the way that you silhouetted Michael in that bit of background and had the video up in the background um, behind him. I mean the visuals in this game are really good. You guys did a fantastic job when it came to coming up with the design that you wanted to go for for this particular title. Thank you. And in fact, one of the uh, users in the chat says we we're talking about eyes. Yeah. Oh no, he says he saw an eye. Yeah. We we're talking about <laughs> eyes. We we're talking about. Yeah, we we're talking about the character's eyes. Yeah. 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 yeah thank you. Uh, as, as I told you, one of the first decisions was Michael's design, and uh, we started with Michael and one of the locations, so that he was like the line, the guidelines for the rest of, of the characters and, and locations. And. Uh, we decided to go with very hard lines, especially in the characters, you know, straight lines, no curved lines at all, because we want them to, you know, to match the tone of the story, you know, very hard, uh, very even very uncomfortable, very uh, disturbing. So uh, we, we focused on some expressionist uh, influences, uh, not only from the historical expressionist period, but also from, you know, nowadays um, designers and painters that can, could be considered as expressionists. And uh, we achieved an style, we wanted to achieve an style that, were, that was very easily recognizable, okay, so that you could see an image of that synchronicity the Morgan today, and you, you could uh, notice at the moment that that's the game, you know. And uh, we think that's very important nowadays because um, you know, there are hundreds and thousands of really interesting and cool games out there. So, you know, it's, it's very important that, that everyone who, who sees a screenshot of your game um, recognizes, you know, recognizes it. 
And, uh, and yeah, we, we, we're, we're very happy with, with uh, the graphic style we, we got because we, we think like uh, it, it communicates lots of things and, and it's a very important part of the game. So the game is split in half, but is there anything that you've had to flat out cut from the game that you've wanted to keep in? Oh, I don't think so. Um, in fact, during the Kickstarter campaign, we reached our first straight goal, which uh, involved uh, including an extra location. And we finally did it, you know, because we could afford it. So I don't think we, we left uh, anything off the game. You know, in fact, that that location was one of the one of the one we had to let out, and we could include it. So I don't think we we had to let uh, anything out. In fact, one of one of the things we couldn't have afforded was the the voice acting. And uh, well, thanks to the Dalek, we could include it. So no, I don't think. It, so, did the Kickstarter cover the entire game, or are you guys going to have to make another Kickstarter in order to make the second part of the game, or are you getting help with Deadlick for that part of the game? Okay. Oh, uh, well, the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter campaign we ran, uh, allowed us to finish the game because uh, you know we had our own savings uh, for the development. And uh, we also have like an institutional loan given by uh, the Spanish government. Uh, you know, it's a line on it's a line of, of loans for for startups, companies. You can you can leave the camp. Well, well, you can do that that way as well. Yeah. Go through that gate. And uh, and uh, well, now that we're focusing on, on on the release, you know, we still have to see how to how to how to focus on the, on the second part so that someone we should decide you know the story is written so the, the story is even split you know the locations and, and characters and puzzles and so forth but before starting to you know fully develop and then the, the second part uh, we want to to focus on the on the release of the game and, and enjoy this moment and listen to backers to and players to you know to learn from the things we made before and so we can make a really an even better second part so would you if you needed to um, do Kickstarter again? Sure, why not? Uh, for us, the, the Kickstarter experience was great. You know? Of course, now it's uh, a year uh, after our campaign. is even harder to do success. You know? it, was, it was hard at that time. Now it's harder. But for us, the experience was, was great. You know? uh, we, we met lots of uh, great backers that, that helped us with the campaign. We had a lot of feedback from them. Uh, we had the support of the media and uh, dev development mates and, and of course so it involves a lot of work but it was a very fulfilling experience so of course we would, we would, we would do it again yeah mm, uh, oh there's the button okay I really like how I kind of did that comic book uh, zoom in when I went over to that side that was really cool yeah, well that, there's another one there yeah. <laughs> that's a really cool transition yeah, well, they Thank you. It was one of the things. This was one of the things I was talking before, that we wanted to to implement to make the experience like more dynamic. You know, because in the location in the exit camp location, uh, well, you see Michael in a very uh, specific uh, size. You know, the sprite of Michael. But these kind of things, you know, like turning the background blue and then overimposing the new location, and in this case, even only. Featuring Michael's shadow, okay, you don't see Michael, you only him, see his shadow. Was uh, you know the things we wanted to to feature to make the game like you know more alive, like like offering a different point of view, you know, uh, uh, beyond the more uh, common point and click adventure experience. And uh, we think that's one of the things that players have liked the most, you know, like like enjoying the change of point of view, enjoying the different the difference in, in, in Michael's sprite size and you know, we really feel like it's been a very good idea. So we've been about an hour so far into the stream. We've got another hour left to go. It's currently 1.14, so we got a little bit less than an hour. As a reminder to chat, anybody who has any questions for Lewis about the game, his company, Kickstarter, um, 
what color pants he wears during the day uh, or anything at all, just feel free to put those yeah. in the chat. No. And I will try to send those over to him if he doesn't see them themselves. Also, when it comes to volumes, I have messed with the volumes a little bit. I've made myself louder. I made the game louder. I made Lewis a little bit louder. So hopefully volumes are okay. If there's any issues with volumes, let me know in chat, and I'll do the best that I can to appease as many people as possible. As we make our way into the city. Yes. So we're actually able to see a say. new area of the game. Welcome I have not gotten this far. I don't remember how what far the game's eyes, demo went. I know I beat the demo. But I don't exactly yeah, well, know where the too. Kickstarter demo stopped, no or how much it changed. Knows it yet. This, this wasn't in the demo. The demo only lasted until you left the comp. And uh, in fact, the demo was, was slightly different. I mean, the puzzles were different. In the demo, we... Uh, the way you left the camp was not the same. There were no bar, um, you know, there were no van, no rows, so lots of things, um, lots of new things in, in the game, you know. So did all that change because the story changed, or did that change because the story wasn't written yet, or anything like that? Yeah, the, the story was written, but uh, we when when we started the development in full time, which was in November two thousand and thirteen, uh, we knew we needed extra funds. Need so we had the um, keep starting the pain in mind from the very beginning, because for us for us it's like a very like a very uh, transparent way of, of funding projects, and it's like okay, this is our project, try it. Uh, see what we are talking about, and if you like it, just please uh, help fund in it. So for us, it was very important to have a demo, you know, to release the, the Kickstarter campaign only when we had a demo available. So what we did was to tweak the plot here and there to remove uh, some locations of the concentration camp. Uh, as I told you, we left the bar out, we left the Roses van out as well. So we had to change the story you know, because, uh, for the demo only. Because, well, to leave the camp now, you have to enter the bar and so forth. So, uh, in fact, for us, the Kickstarter campaign, uh, we, we launched the Kickstarter campaign only when we had the demo finished and, and enough polished and, and tested and so forth. And with now, uh, we think it was a very good idea, you know, because when you launch a starting campaign, one of the most important things is that um, backers trust you, you know, trust your project. And uh, they have to be sure that you're going first, that you're going to, you're, you're going to finish the project and you're going to deliver the rewards and you're going to, you know, make what you said you're going to make. And uh, and they have to like you, you know, what you, what you what you're offering. Okay, so the best thing to that to do that is that okay, you can try this. You know, this is finished. This is small. This is just a demo. The final product will be better, will be longer, will we'll have less bugs, of course. Uh, but this is it. Okay, so if you like it, you can trust us. You know, because the final game is going to be very similar to this, and we think it it worked. You know, and people trust us and it was amazing you know because uh to have the support of uh 1600 people that trust you again that you know gives you the money you know uh, some five dollars some two thousand dollars but it, it's great and it was a very important moment not only because we were sure that the game was going to be finished but but because we felt like the moral support of uh, hundreds of people all around the world and you know it's one of the most uh, beautiful moments uh, with the release of course that we have uh, been through so far yeah i can imagine that but that's the point where you're like okay now we actually have to get to work and get this game done not even my yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, you know, like the, you know, the happiness and the relax lasted, I think, only one day, which was the last day of campaign. Yeah, in fact, it was, it was very, it was very, uh, very pretty thing, you know, because uh, our campaign was uh, funded 
the day before it ended. So uh, it, it ended uh, a Saturday, and um, we we thought of uh, making a stream, a live stream of our studio for all that Saturday, the last day, so to share with uh, everyone the last day of campaign. But luckily, the game was funded the day before, so the last day was like a party, you know. We invited our family there, we had lunch, and uh, we made some contests, and uh, it was, you know, uh, backers asking us things uh, here in, in the Twitch chat, and it was great, you know, we were, you know, very, very happy, ecstatic, you know. But it was a Saturday, and on Monday, it was, it was like, okay, go back to work, everyone working, because we have to finish this game, you know. We have, we have the... the the the, um, the funds of hundreds of people that want the game to be finished when when they want the game finished so uh, we, we had a small delay uh, of about uh, four months uh, when we released the campaign we said the game was going to be finished by uh, the end of 2014 but uh, you know the localization and uh, the voiceover and these kind of things came. so the, the the game was delayed a bit but we think it's it's been worth waiting, you know, because as I told you, the game feels much more alive now. Uh, there's, there's, there's a user asking how many acts does the game contain? Okay. Because when we got to the city, it actually went to Act Two from Act One, which took place in the refugee camp. Yeah, uh, the game is made by four four acts. Uh, we think maybe the the longest acts are Act Two and Act Three. In fact, uh, when we wrote the story and uh, when we des designed the puzzles and so forth, it was like um, you know the, the story starts very linear. You're in you're in uh, Rod's fun, and you can only browse, uh, you can only move through Rod's Rod's ban and Rod's ban explanate. You know the but so only two locations but once you start playing you know more and more location appears now that you've reached the city a lot more of locations appear and as, as soon as you do two three four you so solve two three four puzzles more and more locations appear you know so more and more puzzles more characters and uh, even simultaneous puzzles you know you can choose what, what to do you know but when as, as the game is, is being finished you know it's just like we, we close the plot more and more until in the end you're, there's only one line okay so lots of locations but only one line only one possible line of puzzles so we wanted to offer that that experience so that you could feel more involved in the game so in the middle part of the game uh, there are there, you can do a lot of different things, okay. But as the, the game finishes, like we wanted to guide the player to the end, okay. And we, we think it's been a very good decision because um, it's just like a, a way of uh, fulfilling players' um, expectations, okay. So that uh, in the end, it's just like um, there's only one puzzle, and, and we we feel very proud of with the last puzzles, you know, because they, they have to do with all these uh, Michael's visions that have been happening all over the game, you know. And, uh, and well, we think it's a very interesting mechanic, but I don't want to talk about that because it's it's a surprise. Spoilers. Because all that collapse like You can't be giving away those spoilers. It's okay if you give it away, because you're the developer. I don't want to give away the spoilers. We're all adrift. <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, in a story-driven game like an adventure game, uh, I think it's a pity, you know, because um, part of the charm of these games is the surprise. You know, what's going to happen next? What, what are you going to, what are you going to see? Who are you going to meet? Um, no, no, of course, no spoilers. Yeah, that's something that even when it comes to just reading a review of a point-and-click adventure game can almost spoil the thing for you. You gotta be very, very careful when you're looking into these kind of things. Even the the description on a, 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 a digital distribution page or the back of a box could give away a bunch of stuff. So, with the game as story-driven as point-and-click adventure games, you always have to be very, very careful when you're looking into information for them. Yes. Um, well, to be honest, when when we are expecting a point of adventure, but we, when when I'm expecting a movie, for instance, I try not to read anything, not to watch anything, not to see the trailer, because it's very common that you find things that you regret finding out. You know, so, oh, I, I I would have liked not to know this. You know, 
So we've been very careful. Of course, you have to write a synopsis, you have to write a you know, story or whatever, so that you can talk what the game is about. And um, when you read the description of our game in, in Good Old Games, for instance, uh, you can see, well, there's, a, there's an illness, there's a pandemic, there's a great wave, Michael is amnesiac, so just things from the very beginning of the game, so that there's no, there's no chance to to make spoilers, okay? And uh, we've even been very careful with the trailer of the, of the game. The, the release trailer was released uh, last week, this, uh, on April 10th, the same day the game was released. And uh, we tried to make a suggesting trailer, so with lots of very uh, like intriguing images, but we try not to tell uh, you know specific details of the game or the plot because we feel it's a pity. You know, it's like, oh yes, by watching this, I've tr I've solved this puzzle, you know, because it's here, the solution is here. You know? So we try to be very careful. Okay? But anyway, um, if, if you if you have bought the game and you haven't seen the trailer. I, I wouldn't see it, you know, because because uh, it's just like the surprise is going to be bigger. Thanks for the chat. So you said that there the are company, four acts in the first. In tomorrow comes today, or or tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow comes today. Okay, I would yes. thought I was wrong there because that's also the name of a gorillas song. So I was afraid yeah. that I yeah. didn't I didn't mix those up. But um. Yeah, we we love it. song. Are there also going to be four acts in the second half of the game? Is that going to be just about as long or longer or shorter? Oh, well, um, right now, that you know, the story is written and uh, we have some of the puzzles designed and we're trying to, you know, like trying to uh, deploy, you know, and, and include he, he, this and that so that everything works out. We're not, we're not sure yet about... In fact, the division of the game in acts... Um, has a meaning of like uh, feeling like um, like being aware of the progress you know? Just like, like okay I finished this part and now comes another part and now comes another part so we felt like it was a way to to measure the own players progress um, we feel like it's been a very good decision because because that way it's like you can you can know exactly uh, where you are in the, where you are in the game of course there's a plot reason for that you know, as well for instance the second act starts when you leave the camp and now you have a lot of new locations in front of you the third act starts when you visit a new batch of locations because something very important has happened you know so we've tried to to mix both things you know like a sense of progress and a sense of plot and in the second part we will do the same you know we'll try to divide the the game in acts as well so that you can um, measure your progress mm -hmm. these sort of visions this guy's getting is giving me a matrix feeling a little bit with what you're <laughs> yeah. commenting about them yeah um, it's it's one of the things that uh, we have been very very keen on, you know, like, uh, and, and it's one uh, a very important um, production uh, element, you know, because uh, that that uh, effect is not present in every location, not in all of them, but it's uh, present in a lot of locations, and it means drawing a whole new location, you know, for for that specific scenario. So, for instance, you've been into the church. Well, the church is, has been drawn twice, you know, once. In this uh, uh, destroyed uh, way, and once like uh, built again, you know? and uh, we, it's extra work, of course. But we felt like it was worth the effort of um, including that experience, so that the player felt quite a bit, uh, you know, like uh, surprised, you know, and amazed about Whoa, what, what's happening here. What is this, you know? But it makes sense in the end of the game. And uh, especially in the in the latest part, in the last part of the game, so we feel like it's it's been worth the effort of that extra work. With no A. So, just to go in a little bit more technical discussion here, did you guys create your own engine when it came to working with this game? I know there are a there's a couple point to adventure game engines running out there on the internet, and people have used engines such as Unity to make point to adventure games in the past. Did you guys make your own, or did you use um, something previously? 
Well, uh, we spent quite a lot of time uh, trying engines. Uh, as you said, there are engines uh, specifically designed to make point-and-click adventure games like uh, um, AGS, for instance, it's very, very famous, or Visioner or Wintermute. I think those are the three main engines to make adventure games. And we tried them all, you know, just like we, we decided to spend some time uh, making tests and, and you know. But uh, some things like this effect you saw, you know, these this, this visions, um, the, um, the close-ups and the zooms and the split-screen uh, effects, um, you, you haven't reached any yet, but you will. And you know, this over imposing locations that they just can't be made in, in engines like, like this. Okay? So, and, and those were very, very important for us. So we decided to go with Unity because um, Unity gives you a lot of freedom first. I mean, you can do almost whatever you want, it's, it's very, very powerful. And uh, mainly, uh, you can port the game to lots of different platforms. You know, it's 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 like that. Okay, you it's just like you click a button and you have the Mac version. You click a button and you have the Windows version. Um, it's not that easy, in fact. Okay, because things that work in Mac might not work in Linux, and things that work in Linux might not work in Windows. So you have to be very very careful and look for specific bugs and things like that. You know, but the port options are mm, wonderful and more and more wonderful each day. I think I read today that Unity is going to have support for the new Nintendo system, for instance, and it's, it's great, it's amazing. So those were the two reasons why we decided to go with, with Unity 3D, even if the game is completely 2D. But there are a lot of 2D games made with Unity nowadays because you know it's uh, from uh, starting with one of their latest updates. I think it was uh, a year and a half ago or something. Uh, a lot of 2D um, uh, uh, things were implemented in the engine, so now it's quite easy to make things with, in 2D with Unity 3D. And now that we're working with Unity 3D, uh, we have made our own, you know, like our own in Unity engine, you know, like a specific framework with, for the game, so that uh, now that we have made this first game uh, for the next part, it's going, to go, it's going to be much easier, you know, because now everything's working, so it will be easier. This must be the famous suicide yeah, I've heard that so it can be difficult to make 2D stuff with Unity, the and they've constantly been working on fun. trying to make it a bit easier. But have you had any issues when it came to porting the game over onto other platforms? And what all platforms is the game currently available for? Okay. Well, now, uh, the game now is available for PC, Mac, and Linux. Uh, the Linux version is not uh, on some platforms yet, but it will. And, um, and uh, as I told you, uh, to export different uh, versions, it's very... It's very easy, you know, it's just like you press one button and that's it. But it is true that, for instance, we've met some, we've we found some uh, problems with, uh, with the layers, you know. Some layers are hidden in some platforms, so you have to be very careful when, when you do the testing. Uh, maybe you have to change the, uh, the order the, they are arranged, you know, because uh, some layers uh, remain invisible in some platforms. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I think Unity 3D was mainly was was at first uh, developed for Mac systems, and uh, and it's great. We work with Windows, but I myself work with with Mac systems, and uh, it's funny that you know there are these differences between Mac and Windows versions, no? but. Um, but I th as I told you, it's very easy because you you only have to to code one. You know, all the things are just to tweak here and there. And uh, uh, right now, as I told you, the game is going is available for PC, Mac, and Linux. And uh, well, we we are not sure about which other platforms the game is going to be released. You know, uh, of course, now that we're working with Unity, it will be very easy to explore for other platforms. But yeah, that's something we should decide later. Yeah, it's something I was wondering, because I've seen a lot of point-to-click adventure games, such as Broken Age, I was talking about a little bit earlier, have released on iOS, and a couple of them have made their way onto console platforms. Not a lot of them, because it can be difficult when it comes to trying to get a good control scheme on a console, as opposed to a PC with mouse and keyboard. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's our main uh, that that's our main concern about that. You know, when you think when we think about porting the game to other platforms, the the main uh, like like the main requirement is that the game is can be uh, easily played. You know, because the hardware of of that platforms allows to play the game in a proper way. So so yes, of course, uh, in in some consoles for instance the controls i think it will be they will be very very even uncomfortable i don't know but we have to try because uh well as i, as I told you the the only thing we have to be sure is that the game is can be uh the, the, the experience is, is, is going to be good you know but that's 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 the only thing to consider you know the, the, the hardware is nice uh if you want some kind of advice as well hmm? do you want some kind of hint um, sure. We've got about half hour left, so anything to help okay, show so the game off a little bit more? Yeah. Where specifically that you, you want people to see? Yeah, so go. So you, you can go back to the entrance to the gate of the park, which is location to, to the right, yeah. Hello, hello, because, hello. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. You hear my, me? my computer made that disconnect sound, so... I just wanted to make sure my microphone was still connected and okay, broadcasting. Okay, okay. okay. You, you see that sign? You see the sign on the tree? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can grab it. Okay. Yeah. So you take the plank and you take some nails. And now... Yeah, that's a plank with, with a message in it, on it. And now... Uh, I think you try to to excavate a little under the gate. Yeah, I think you did, I think you did it with your hands because, yeah, uh, okay, that, you see looser, that, looser so, okay. You could try to excavate with a plank, but you're gonna, you're not going to make it, you know, I can tell you. <laughs> so you have to look for something to excavate, okay. So you and, have to uh, do the old classic improvisation when you don't have what you need. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta make a shovel. Yeah, some kind of, yeah. So, let's see. Can he pick up the manhole? He can Impossible. now pick up the manhole. Uh, it's not that it's super heavy. It would have been a good idea. Yeah. Hardly any place <laughs> but it was not going to be that easy. Yeah, one of the, as I told you, one of the things we wanted to... The, the solution is in the charts, by the way, if you want to save time. <laughs> one of the things I, I told you is that we wanted to, to get a... Uh, very balanced difficulty. So, of course, you can be stuck trying to enter the camp for a, I don't know, a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes or whatever, or 20 minutes. But in the end, I'm sure you will eventually do it, you know, because that's, it only takes to, to stop and think to find the solution. That could be a good shovel as well, but you're not going to be able to take it. A metal sign bolted to the wall. It's the logo of the lo and from what I can see. Maybe in the chart you will find some interesting stuff. Did we do it? Okay. So if you press spacebar now. Okay, you'll see some glass, some shards glass down, down there. It just, okay, you have the glass shards there. So you could try to, you could try to excavate with the glass shards, but you're not going to make it. But that's a clue, that's a hint, okay? So now you'll have to find uh, a bigger glass to excavate. And now, if you try to touch the the sculpture, if you, if you touch it, you try to to grab it. Okay, you'll see. Oh, it's a bit loose. So maybe it would it would be a good idea to break the glass, the big glass. Okay. You know, you have bad intentions. Oh, you're going to destroy a piece of art, you know? 
this is signed with your just adventure. This, this is Father. This is Reverend Blake. It's one of the most, uh, well, uh, according to our, to our opinion, it's one of the most interesting characters in the game. You know? He's some kind of uh, visionary, and um, his, his uh, speeches are really convoluted, you know, it's just like uh, really hard to understand, you know. And the, the, the recording, the voiceover of this character was very funny, you know, because we wanted something very, very dramatic, you know, with, with this. Um, deep talk about the fate and the signals and these things and it was very really funny you know? and uh, it's, go it's going to be a very important uh, character in the game later on you know even for some specific puzzles and one of the most uh, special puzzles of the game has to do with them you know with with reverend blake i can't tell anything else but um but you're going to meet him again haven't you but there's still time all is not lost. We still have time. Salvation lies in the place where it all began, in the ruins. And now, once the conversation, well, his uh, speech ends, now you can grab a really big piece of glass. Well, okay, here you are. Next to this enormous hunk of glass. Now you've found a really good shovel. Look ridiculous. I'd better get rid of them. I I can't hear you right now, make a pie. I don't know if you're maybe now your micro is not working or maybe it's my system, but I can't hear you. Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me again? Oh, now, now I hear you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Apparently, um, well, my mic. I thought I heard my mic disconnect. It might have actually disconnected. So. Oh, now I can hear you. Hopefully, we're yeah. gonna go. But what I was saying, um, is what price do you have on the game oh. currently? And did you have a lot of trouble trying to figure out that price? Oh uh, well, uh, no. It, now it's uh, nineteen euros ninety nine cents, so about twenty euros, and um, it was something that um, that Alec and us discussed, and uh, you know we agreed on, on that price. Uh, uh, well, I, I can't remember exactly the conversion to another currencies. You know, uh, but it's more, I think it's more or less the same. I can't be sure about that. Yeah. And now you're going to enter one of our favorite locations. I think, I'm trying to think, I think the conversion rate would be, a, is a little bit less from when it comes to euros to the US dollar. I think, I'm trying to, I'm not, I think maybe a euro is like worth over a dollar or maybe it's under a dollar. I don't remember it exactly off the top of my head. Oh, this place is cheerful. Yeah, this is the Swiss. The suicide park. Yeah, it's a very happy place to have a walk on a Sunday. Oh, right. Well, that's uh. Yeah, let's zoom in on that. That needs to be zoomed in on. Yeah. Oh man. Could any of them have imagined All right. meeting an end like this that's, back uh, then? That's fantastic. Yeah, when you were saying that this game's uh, a bit more mature than the themes that goes to dark areas, you weren't kidding, were you? Did was close the park. They didn't even bother hmm. their bodies. No, I bodies. wasn't. No, I wasn't. Um, as I told you, um, we want the players to have a good time, even having this uh, bad time. You know, we, our main goal with the play, with the game is to move players, okay, to to make them uh, feel things. You know, sometimes they will feel you know this proud of solving puzzles. Sometimes they will feel anger about some characters. Some sometimes they will feel even very pity. You know, like sorrow for other characters that have a really um, sad past. So that that's our goal, in fact. You know, to tell a story and. To, to get the, the players moved. Because for us, that's one of the things that video games, as movies, as books, as series, whatever, can, you know, can, can, can uh, make on, on a viewer, a reader, or a player. You know? So why not? You know? Why not move the player with a dark story, you know? telling sad stories and, and make the, making the players do really uh, disturbing things? You know? Wait a minute. 
for us it's very important that to, to, to make the prayer fields fields things from this tree no don't do it please no good God yeah there definitely aren't a lot of games that go super far when it comes to that kind of stuff a lot of games nowadays like to play it safe and you mentioned very early in the review a game like um, I have no mouth but I'm a scream as well as sanitarium and those games yeah. I think I have no mouth but I'm a scream went in so far that it has been censored like all over the place from what I remember of that game, it, it's kind of actually difficult to get a hold of the full version of the game. In at least some countries. But, you mean uh, I have an amount? Yeah, yeah, because uh, there was one of one of the stories was related even to you know to the Nazis and, and to these uh, experiments they made with with people, and, uh, and in fact it was it was it was crazy, it was insane, you know. And um, I, I can't remember how old I, I was when I when I played it, you know. But maybe I was too young. I mean, uh, maybe at that time uh, we didn't feel even uh, parents didn't think of video games as something that could be you know transgressive and to tell mature games and things like that, you know. And uh, well, it's, it's it's a very very hard game. Yeah, it's very very dark. Impossible. I'll need something that cuts better. Uh, All right, so I it's going to be quite, a quite difficult. Yeah. I can go yeah, yeah, that yeah. sign. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Work. Maybe with the help of the crowbar, I can get the... Don't talk about it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> there actually is quite a lot of dialogue in this game. I've managed to tear it down. The yes, there's uh, more than 60,000 words, which is quite a lot. And uh, as I told you, we think the game, I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's about 30 characters or so. And um, we've tried to give every character a background, you know, so every character has his, his own story, you know, and we've tried to reflect that on the dialogues. So just by talking to them, you can know about their past, you know, and some of the characters have a really, really um, sad story, and um, yeah, not only because they are living now in quite a hard situation, like the new world, you know, in, in the game we called the, we call the new world to this situation the after the great uh, after great wave world, but because they weren't happy before, you know. And um, some characters like um, Rose, for instance, it's one of the most special characters in the game, have a really sad story behind her. Um, some characters like the Hunter had a really hard um, childhood, which is what uh, it made uh, him be like he is now. And, uh, you know, we've been very careful in that, you know, like uh, making every character has an interesting story, story to tell. You know. Even some of the stories affect the actual gameplay and the story and the puzzles. Was it difficult to figure out what to write lines for? And what not to? I've heard that that for some point of click adventure games, like a lot of point, the the old point of click adventure games, they had dialogue for just about everything in the environment. But then again, a lot of those games weren't voice acted. That's back when you did a lot of text box stuff. So was it very difficult to figure out what should have a line of dialogue and what shouldn't? Yes, well. We've tried to well. One one of the things about our game, as I as I told at the beginning, is that it's well quite open, considering it's a point and click adventure. I mean, you can interact uh, at a you know at any, when you're or if, when you're finishing the game. There are a lot of locations available, so uh, you can make really a, a lot of interactions. I mean, you can take you can pick an item on location number one, and use that item on an hot a hot spot on location number uh, twenty nine. Six hours later, okay. So there are a lot of possible interactions between objects and hotspots and characters and, and other objects. So uh, of course, uh, lots of those interactions are you know general generic sentences like "I can't do it," "That makes no sense," uh, "I think it's not a good idea." Of course, like in every point-and-click adventure, what we've tried to add 
lots of specific interactions. Okay, so um, even when you use a hotspot with a specific uh, item, or, or on the contrary, uh, I'm sorry, an item with a specific hotspot, even if that's uh, useless for the game, lots of things you will get in return quite a uh, no, fan line or, uh, or a, a dark joke or whatever. And in fact, we've tried to, to, uh, imp to implement uh, achievements of the game that are playable, for instance, on Steam and, and um, soon in good old games, I think, uh, in which you, you are rewarded for those uh, even odd interactions. Okay? So to unlock some of these achievements, uh, you only have to use a specific item with a specific hotspot, no matter how weird they are, and then you'll get some reward, you know, maybe because you unlock an achievement, or maybe because um, uh, you get a very fun line, or whatever. And uh, in fact, for those achievements, we've tried to, we've made some, some kind of a list of movies uh, from the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s that were very important for us, you know. In fact, the name of the achievements are, I don't know, Rosemary's Baby, or um, God told me to, or Hellraiser, or um, uh, uh, Logan's Run, you know, uh, names of movies that influenced us from that time. And we've, in, we've tried to pay some kind of an homage to, to those movies just by naming the achievements after them. Reference, references are a very important thing when it comes to achievements. Yeah, yeah. For, for us, we you know we, we really had a good time uh, uh, writing the achievements and designing the achievements. All right. So I'm trying to figure out what I need to do here. I think I need to get the bolt cutters from this guy, so I can cut through the trees in the park. But. I'm not exactly sure how to do that, considering he is holding on to them to get inside this building. So I gotta get him inside the building. I need to get in here, but please mm. don't make too much noise. I don't think there's anything I can do to help at the moment. I can't help you. Help me. Is there like a super soldier serum or something I can use to get super buff really quick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what was that? In Castle Crashers, they had the sandwich. She ate a sandwich, made you stupidly buff. That would be fantastic. But we're getting close to the end of our stream here. It is about nine minutes till, so if anybody <laughs> tossed the old man through the window, I don't know if that's will work. Um, but if anybody has any last-minute questions here for Lewis, feel free to throw those in chat. And Lewis, if you have any contacts or anything that people can use to keep track of you, uh, the development studio, the development of the game, anything like that, feel free to throw those out there now. Okay, sure, yeah, you, you can uh, contact us. Uh, we have a website that is www.fixurama.com. Um, we have uh, our Twitter account, which is Dead Synchro that synchro, like the beginning of that synchronicity. And um, we usually um, answer every email, every question, every whatever, because um, you know we, we love to have that interaction with, with the community, backers, players, or, you know, it's very, very uh, useful for us, in fact. And uh, so if you have a question or whatever, you can contact us and we will, of course, delightfully uh, answer you. Uh, and thank of course, you very thanks. much thanks. for uh, talking to me thanks. today. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, and yeah. for those of you looking to keep track of anything that I might be doing, you can follow me on Twitter, which is at MegapieManPhD. I also have my own Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash MegapieManPhD. And I have my own YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash MegapieManPhD. And I'm actually thinking of covering this game on my YouTube channel. I do a thing over there called Quick Peaks, which is sort of like a first impression review series. So I'm thinking of covering this game over there because I like it a lot. It's got a really cool design. Um, it's got a really interesting story, just a really interesting world. And I'm a big fan of it so far, even though I haven't played it uh, a lot. I haven't really got that far, but I'm really liking what I'm seeing here. And I think you guys did a really good job. Thank you, thank you very much, Megapie, and well, thank you, Good Old Games, for giving us a chance to have this this uh, kind and conversation with you.
reviews and very fun, I must admit, and to read the users' questions, and well, it's been great. Um, uh, well, thank you. All right, we'll give a few more minutes here just in case anybody has any last, last-minute questions. Sure. But if you have anything you want to say, say it now or forever hold your peace. As I'm oh. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that, that, so, that's very dramatic. You, if there's something you want to answer, you can say it by mail. <laughs> send it by mail. Send it to the Twitter. Yeah. What goes on inside that church? Has everyone gone right. completely crazy? I have to say, yeah, well, now that you, now that we're seeing, seeing the Zoom, uh, two of these characters are based on uh, on Backer's depiction. I mean, the the first and the third are backers from our Kickstarter campaign. So, you know, there were rewards that uh, included to be depicted in the game. So this this guy with the jacket and the guy with the hat are real people, and you know, it's been very fun to 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 get the, their pictures and to depict them and you know it's been it's been really great was that one of the backer rewards yes and uh uh, there are about, I can't remember, maybe five or even six people. The barman, for instance, the, the people uh, after, behind the bar, uh, it, it's, it's a backer as well. Um, well, there's a nurse that will be uh, featuring the game later on. Uh, you will find her, you will meet her. She's, she's a backer as well. And um, let me think, I uh, can't remember right now. But I think there were about four or five people. Ah, well, there's a soldier as well that you haven't met yet, who is a... a Backer as well, so it was great. You know, because it was company. like um, real backers in the game itself. So you know, it's, it's been very fun. That's definitely really cool. There doesn't seem to be any questions popping up right now. So thank you again for show, helping me show the game off and talking to me today. I really do appreciate it. And be sure to check this game out on GOG. It's currently available for I think you said twenty euros. Yeah, twenty euros. Yes, it is available yeah, well, DRM free yeah. on GOG. Um, I think I don't think that has all of the builds on GOG.com yet. Oh, uh, I think the Linux version is missing yet. It will it will arrive soon. I have to say that currently the game has ten percent off in GOG, and you can get as well a set of uh, really cool wallpapers based on the Dead Synchronicity uh, oh. art style. So it's a good chance to grab uh, the game now on, on GOG.com. All right, so definitely look into it if you see anything you like here today. Pick it up while it is somewhat cheap. Definitely support your indie devs and definitely support the Point and Click Adventure games because they're difficult to make well, and when they're done well, they're, they're really done well. And this one, I think, is a very good example of a modernization of the classic genre. So thank you to everybody in chat. Thank you again, Lewis. Be sure to check this game out on GOG.com. Have a make a pie, man, and I will talk to you guys. Later. Thank you very much.